Welcome to the Foul Play YouTube channel. <laughs> Great. Oh, we got we got that one guy. Beautiful. Well, look, guys. Um, are we all uh, live? Uh, Jack sixty one. We're all good. Ah, uh, awesome, awesome, fantastic. Oh, well, look. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, and welcome to uh, all the panel uh, members and everyone in chat. Uh, it's great to see you here, um, and I'm excited. We're all excited. Uh, it's really good to be back. Uh, and today we're going to start a new podcast series, uh, which hopefully that you'll find uh, entertaining and exciting. Um, it's been a little while since I've been on, uh, and also with Neverly. But let me assure you that um, we have been working slowly, quietly in the background. Uh, and Neverly has come up with an excellent new suggestion. Uh, and what we're going to be doing today, guys, and in the future, we've started a new podcast series uh, entitled um, Making a Murderer, uh, Reading with the Crew. And I know that a lot of people have requested um, that the Foul Play team uh, read uh, passages and chapters from John Farrakh's book, uh, entitled The Wrecking Crew. Uh, and instead of uh, reading the entire book from the beginning to the end, um, what we're going to do is we're going to read selective chapters. Uh, and the reason for doing this is that we want to uh, show the relevance um, of specific chapters, especially with the new filing done by Kathleen Zellner. And so Neville and I thought that what we would do, instead of just reading from chapter one right to the end of the book, we're going to choose selective chapters first, those which are very, very relevant. Uh, and as you can see, the very first chapter uh, that we're going to read is entitled uh, Bobby's Garage. And I'll tell you what, that is an absolute ripper uh, when you consider uh, what's happening now with Kathleen Zellner's filing. Um, and if you're following the book, if you have the book, I, I, I think most of the panel members here will consider John Farrakh's book as one of the very best on the Stephen Avery, Brendan Dassey case. Um, John Farrakh is a well-renowned well journalist and he's written some incredible pieces of work. Uh, he's an investigative journalist. He, he deep dives which is fantastic because that's what we do here as well on the Foul Play team. Um, and so what we want to do is present to you uh, various chapters and the way we're going to do it as a team, uh, we're going to read the, the chapter out, but we're going to make it casual, right? So at any, at any stage, we can stop and ask questions. And guys, what we would like to do is to make it interactive with you guys in chat. So if you've got a question, do not hesitate to uh, ask and we can discuss. We're not on a, we're not on a time um, constraint here. Uh, what we want to do is to make these podcasts, um, my, my team mem members don't believe me, we want to make it short and sharp, maybe go for about an hour, hour and a half. So keep it nice and focused um, uh, because there's a lot, a lot to cover. Um, and uh, Jack61 will back me up. Uh, we're on a panel with Jeff Jones at the moment looking at making a murderer too. <laughs> and no joke, we spent, what, close to an hour, Jack61? And that's before the show, the the episode had even started properly. Oh, yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we don't know how it's going to go. So hopefully you'll enjoy us, uh, enjoy the ride with us. Well, look, without further ado, uh, first of all, I'd like to say a few things and then we'll make a start. Uh, I'd like to thank, personally thank everyone in chat and also my fellow panel members um, for all their love and support. Um, I was actually very sick. Uh, it was a very uh, trying time for me personally. I'm sort of over the edge now. I'm, I'm getting better, which is great. And uh, it goes to show how professional our team is. Um, and the fact that we are a team uh, and others can pick up the slack 
and do excellent work. And uh, I, I would like to thank everyone on the panel for the excellent work that they've done over the last six or so weeks. It's just been awesome. Um, also, I'd like to thank everyone in chat for their uh, well wishes. Uh, guys, we're here, we're here because of you guys, and that's awesome. So if you like what we do, uh, please subscribe. Uh, or give us a thumbs up if you enjoy our podcast. And all of us here at Team Foul Play would like to thank each and every one of you. We have hit over 2,000 subscribers, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, and recently it was our third birthday, right? And uh, when you think when we first started this journey, we had no subscribers, we had very few members. Um, I remember the founders, we all got together and uh, we decided what we we're going to do, whether we we're just going to completely abandon uh, these cases here. But in the end, our, our love and our passion, uh, we wanted to continue. And most of the members here, we were part of originally with Rubber Ducky many, many years ago. Uh, and because of creative differences, we parted ways. We did it equitable. And it was a very, very hard thing to do at that time. But um, I'm so impressed that the people that we have attracted to our Foul Play channel, uh, and you can see the core group here uh, made up of founders, staff members, and mods. Uh, and um, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. It's a, a truly, um, I'm truly blessed uh, to be a small part of this group. And uh, we're all different, right? We don't all agree right? We're not all clones. We have uh, various different opinions, you know, with everything. And that, and that's, I believe, our strength, right? So thank you so much for that. Uh, don't forget, we also have a merchandise store where you can support us. A lot of us have got t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, and things like that. And uh, uh, Susan uh, and also Zoe have done a fantastic job uh, putting that together and uh, we've earned quite a bit of money, which we all pass on. Uh, you know, we, we don't hold on to any of the money at all. There's uh, various causes and charities um, to do with uh, innocents, um, people that have been wrongfully convicted, uh, and we donate that money. Uh, and any money that we do make uh, through the subscriptions and also from the views from our YouTube channel, we use that judiciously, um, and Jack61 and others have been very active uh, in um, foyers, right? And you can see the foyers that we have obtained and uh, some of the stuff that's in there is simply mind-blowing. Well, look, guys, just so that we don't waste any more time, what I like to do is go around the, the panel and just a quick introduction to everyone. Uh, Jack61. Uh, hello, guys. Hello in the chat. Thanks for coming along and joining us. I'm here in um, Southwest Michigan, raring to go. This should be a really relevant to uh, Zelda's PCR motion, Bobby's garage. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm anxious to get to it. Let's do it. Fantastic. Thank you, Jack61. Uh, next, we have Neverly. Welcome back. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> How's the good girl? Hello, everyone, again. And um, hello, panel. It's good to be back. And um, I miss you all. It's great to see the chat popping. We already have, like, over 30 people. That's awesome. And um, I'm super excited about Zellner's latest filing. I think this one is the best so far. And I can't wait to um, get on it. Fantastic. I'm in Southern California, and it's super hot and humid. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Neverly. Um, next, we have Alice. Welcome, Alice. Hi, Doc, Jax, Neverly, everyone on panel. Nice to see Neverly and Doc back with us again. Um, you were really missed. And hello, everyone in chat. It's fantastic to see so many, and I look forward to our new podcast. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alice. And uh, next we have, I don't recall. 
Hi, everybody, and welcome. Fantastic. Thank you, I don't recall. And next, of course, we have uh, Sugar. <laughs> welcome. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Doc. Hi, everybody. Happy Saturday. Looking forward to this. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sugar. <laughs> I mean, Susan. <laughs> oh, my. I still got reading with Uncle Ked in my head. And uh, last but not least, we have just Rhonda. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to you, everybody. Welcome to everyone on the panel in the chat. And I'm ready to go. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Uh, so, Jack, um, are you able to put up the very first slide? And, uh, Neville, are you just about ready for reading? You need to unmute your microphone. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to pop off camera. Guys, give me, give me about 10 seconds here, and I'll, I'll get everything pulled up. No hassles. Thank you. So, remember, guys. Thank you uh, for reminding me. Yep. <laughs> remember, guys, this is the first time we're doing this. It's very flexible. We don't know how it's going to go, but uh, we're looking forward to it. So provide feedback, uh, tell us how we can improve um, and what you would like to see. But uh, what we'll do is we'll go over the slides and uh, please ask questions if you have anything. Awesome. All right. So we'll just wait uh, for the very first slide to come up. There we go. Oh, hold on. Okay, Neville, you can see the slide? Uh, no. It'll be, be on, in, it'll be, be in YouTube. Yep. Mm. We'll just wait a sec. Yeah, please. Yep. So if you go to the YouTube channel, uh, it's in there. Or it's in the, I put all the slides in the, um, on our, on our, on, on our private room. On air text. On air text. That's text. what I'm looking for. And I can't find it. All the way, just in go the, all the way to the top. Beginning of, because everything is split text. out. Have you got it, Neverly? It's on no, on air text. Where is it? On air text in Discord. So it's either in the Discord channel or on YouTube. Right above where we're recording in the room. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you so you much. You got it. And there yes. You go. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, chapter 29, Bobby's Garage. When Strang and Buting were preparing for trial, they had retained the services of Pete Bates, the retired Illinois police detective whose claim to fame was that he, he was involved in the congressional investigation of James Earl Ray surrounding the 1968 assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. After retiring from law enforcement, Bates moved back to his native Manitowoc County. However, the defense was handicapped at trial because Kratz had failed to turn over the computer disk with the violent pornography of Bobby Das's computer. As a result, Trang and Buting were unable to aggressively present a convincing case pointing the finger at Bobby Dassey as the more likely killer of Teresa Halbach. Bates has remained unwavering in his belief that the most likely people involved in Teresa's murder and dismemberment were Bobby Dassey and Scott Tadich. In 2016, he reached out and spoke with Kathleen T. Zellner, about his suspicions and never heard back from, from the firm. Then in 2018, he got a call out from the blue. It was Elmer. Can Based we, on uh, the author, yes. Can we, can we just stop there? 
um, who was actually aware or who was not aware about Bates contact, contacting Kathleen Zellner? I Me. forgot. I, 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 I yeah. remember reading this, but I actually have forgot completely about yep. that. No. Yep. Isn't that incredible? I, when I read that and I saw it, I thought, oh, my God, because Bates, of course, was one of the investigators for Strang and Buting, and uh, a lot of this chapter is actually due to the work of Bates, and he was so suspicious of uh, the events surrounding Bobby Dassey and also Scott Tadich, that he actually informed Kathleen Zellner. I was completely this, unaware of that. Yeah, and this is nine years after, pretty much around nine years after Stephen was imprisoned. That's right. So once okay. Kathleen Zellner took over, good on him to contact her, because he didn't have to, of course. You know what I mean? But he did. Correct. Correct. So in effect, he was following the case very, very closely, right? And he became very suspicious that what the state had put forward, what Mr. Kratz and his team had put forward, simply could not have been true. And it was Bates that put all this information together and he contacted Kathleen Zellner. I was not aware of that. And it's amazing how <laughs> they made the point that both Strang and Buting were hamstrung because they could not mention a third party Denny, right? And guess what Kathleen Zellner's new filing is all about, right? So it goes to show how important the work done by Bates was all the way back then. Remarkable. Yes, very. And the way, as we read along, we knew all of this information pretty much, but the way it was put together is what's remarkable. Correct. Correct. Uh, would continue? you like to? Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Okay. Bates told the author that Tadich had apparently become paranoid since Zellner has aggressively put him, him and Bobby under the microscope. Bates said he learned from Zellner that Tadich is making sure he picks up all of his cigarette butts for fear that somebody would retrieve them since he couldn't, uh, since he could leave his DNA on them. Wow. Uh, Neverly, ne Neverly, if I could just yes. add, in Australia, uh, a serial killer who was on the loose for a long period of time, I believe in Western Australia, they nabbed him because he had left DNA on a cigarette butt, but also, I believe, on a disposable coffee cup. So the police, yeah. the detectives were following him until he had discarded that particular item in a bin. They retrieved it. They were able to get the DNA from those items and they got a match to the crime scenes. And it's very interesting that Scott... T now, we're not saying that Scott Tadich has done anything, right? Please understand. Nor not Bobby. Saying anything. Or nor Bobby. We're just reading this chapter out, but it's remarkable <laughs> that Scott was doing the same things to prevent anyone picking up cigarette butts to extract DNA from, which is very interesting. Because, guys, it, is it true that Scott Tadich never gave a DNA sample or fingerprints? Not as far as no. I'm aware. He did not. No. 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 He was not required. It, it makes me think Which I also think that it's weird. 823, correct. What was that, Neverly? I think that that's really, um, I don't know why they didn't, because they interviewed him. And he was correct. there, he placed himself there, he alibied Bobby, you know what I mean? So to me, correct. I would think that they would want, because he was also that other person, on, even though he didn't live there, he dated Barb, the mother of Brendan and Bobby, Steven's sister, Correct. you know what I mean? So I think that there's enough connection for him to be maybe, maybe, allegedly implicated. So it's shocking that they didn't. Correct. Three, yeah. but, um, th three interviews, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they took Matt Avery's DNA. Yeah, yeah. they did. You know, I mean, of all they people, did. they took Matt Avery's DNA, but yet they didn't take Tadget's DNA. 
I do not understand that whatsoever. I mean, they were going after Stephen. Yeah, fair, fair enough, get his DNA. So why go for Ma's DNA? You know what I mean? And then, as you say, Neverly, not take his DNA. That has bugged me a lot since this case, you know. But then they didn't take Ryan's or that either. So, Correct. you know, Correct. with the shoe fits, you know, they, these wee pieces of puzzles get put all together and maybe we'll get a one puzzle. Uh, yeah, a full puzzle. Yeah. Yeah, Excellent point. Yeah. Excellent point. The uh, law enforcement never considered Scott Tadich as a person of interest, right? And uh, you are, you're so correct. They did take DNA from Ma Avery. And I could remember reading the report by Sharie Cohane, who, now wait for it, had excluded Ma Avery as putting her DNA on the handcuffs and leg irons in Stephen Avery's bedroom. Mm. Now, do you think that was... Do you think that was necessary to mention in a formal report that goes up to Peg Lockenschlachter? Lockenschlachter. I mean, we've lost all sense of real sensibility here. You know, to write that in a report, you know, clearly, right? And someone like Scott Tadich, no DNA. Ryan Hilligus, Scott Blowtorn, no DNA, right? Although they knew the victim, Bradley Check. No DNA. It's remarkable. Yeah. What Ryan the... didn't have an alibi, and that flu that was okay with them. Correct, correct, correct. Yeah, they they want to leave that innuendo out there, Doc. Uh, that's just so disgusting to me. Oh, that's correct. That's correct. And not to forget the Michael O'Kelly email that talked about the fact that the whole family was involved in incest, right? And you think to yourself, oh, my God. So quite clearly, the uh, the Avery and Dassey families were not well respected or liked in the community. And it goes to show, I mean, unfortunately. No, really, Doc, because that's, that certain part about incest and things like that and families, always seems to sort of come up somewhere along the lines and a, a, a murder investigation or something like that, you know, because the same thing, exactly the same thing happened in the Luke Mitchell case when he done the yeah. interview with his mum and she Point. was stroking the back of his neck, being yes. a comforting mum and just playing with his hair at the back of his neck. Well, that got turned into they were sleeping together and everything like that yeah. in an incestuous relationship. It seems to be the go-to sort of thing that Correct. I think so too, Alice. Offer, you know, to try and taint the Averys or the Mitchells or whatever, you know, to make them sound even worse than what they what what they're not, you know. So. It, it just boggles my mind that they they always seem to sort of come round to that sort of incest on things, no matter what type of family or whatever it is, you know, it seems to get brought Correct. up. Oh, there was incest in the family, so-and-so was sleeping with so-and-so, you know, and it's just madness. I think Correct. that it comes Correct. from the same playbook of uh, vilifying, how to vilify somebody yes. in the eye of the public. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. It, it's basically dehumanizing a family yep. so that you feel no sympathy towards them. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's exactly what Kratz did. Um, we know what he did in his book. We, we know what he did during his trial. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when people have that attitude that they felt that they needed to include that statement about Mama Avery, you know they've crossed the line. They've crossed the boundaries. So, yeah, unbelievable. Okay. And allegedly, and then, also had some incest going on in his family, from what I read on Reddit and um, that other website that I can't recall the name. So correct. It's yeah. Who are you talking about? Web Sle Web Sleuths. Correct. No, it was that Brian something. Brian McCorkle. You are talking oh. about comedy leader Brian? Yes, Convoluted. that one. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Correct. So, accusing who? Katurik. Oh, Katurik. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I, I also agree with uh, Ronald K. 
Cass, welcome to chat. Uh, yeah, A23 is extremely important in this particular case, right? Uh, and also with what Jack61 said uh, about the flashcard in the back of Teresa Horbach's um, SUV, that's going to be very important too, especially if there's, they, I believe there was DNA, but they didn't do any extraction uh, on that. Is that correct, Jack61? Yep, it's ready to, it was ready to submit for profile and she didn't do it. It just stopped. That's correct. Correct. So DNA in this case uh, is extremely important and the analysis has not been complete. And the question is, why? <laughs> why is it complete? Okay, Neverly, would you like to continue? Sure. The background that we've done on him is that we had an individual who had no respect for women and he was aggressive with them, Bates said. He was, he's still talking about Scott Adage. He's what we cops would call an asshole. Bates said the story presented a trial suggesting that Teresa's body was burned in Avery's outdoor burn pile pit was preposterous. Bates said the burn pit was almost on top of the garage and if the flames got as high as Tadich testified at trial, the whooping fire, the entire garage would have gone up in flames and the propane gas tank that was also nearby likely would have caught fire and caused a great explosion. Uh, Neville, Bates said, Neville, yes. Neville, yeah, uh, sorry to interrupt, but you made a very, very good point. Right, and who was a star witness against Stephen Avery in the trial? Who was another star witness against Stephen Avery? Scott. Yeah, the uh, soon-to-be brother-in-law. Scott Tadich, correct. Yeah. Stephen Avery's a brother-in-law, and it's remarkable how both Bobby Dassey and also Scott Tadich became the state's star witnesses, and Scott Tadich was extremely damaging. For Stephen, because guys, as we know, Scott Tadich mentioned seeing a great big whopping fire, right? So, but it not only that it was a whopping fire, Doctor Silkman. So sorry to interrupt, but it grew correct. each time they talked to him. The fire got bigger and bigger. That's so he correct. was changing his statements, and that's, that's the that's troubling that's part. That's correct, and it's remarkable that Bates picked it up early mm -hmm. on, right? And he said that the burning of Teresa Horbach in that small burn pit or open burn pit area was preposterous, right? And that's remarkable that it was picked up back then, right? Amazing. And we also heard from Redont how law enforcement wanted him to make the fire bigger. Mm-hmm. Excellent point. Excellent point. And that's actually mentioned in this chapter as well. Uh -huh. yeah. So, guys, mm -hmm. yeah, do we have any questions in chat so far? Just see some conversation, but you know, one final comment. But you know, before we start reading again, is that Scott also said that that fire was the most memorable thing of the of the day of that day. When in fact, yes. his first statement on November tenth, two thousand five, to the DCI, there was no fire mentioned at all. Correct. Correct. Because it's pretty obvious that the investigators and Kratz knew that to convert a human being to those small bone fragments that we see in the box needed a massive amount of heat, right? And constant heat, which means yep. that I am sure that Scott Tadich was put under pressure to say, um, how big was that fire? Are you sure it was three feet? And then eventually in court, he said that it was as high as the garage. Right? Massive. Whopping. Do we know what, what year was this book written? 2016. Um, yes, it's a relatively recent book. It, and all, when you think about the timing, he mentions twenty eighteen in here, Jeff. It, it, it may, it, yes, it, it, it may be, it may be twenty eighteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking. Of, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm thinking about another frack book. I apologize. That's a, the one that you and I are reading. You know, he's done. Been you yeah, and I have been listening to. 
Yeah, he's done quite a lot. He's done quite a lot. Okay, Neville, would you like to continue? Yes, sure. Bates said that any old school detective, someone familiar with flames and burning trash, would have realized Teresa's body was incinerated inside of a 50-gallon steel drum. In other words, the burn barrel. Nobody in their right mind would have taken the chance of simply tossing the body outside because the weather elements are too unpredictable. The use of a burn barrel would allow the killer to conceal the crime because nobody would see there was a body inside unless they physically walked to the barrel and peered inside. And the fact remains, several of Teresa's bones were recovered from the bottom of Bobby's burn barrel and nobody else's, Bates said. Although Bates suspects the police from Manitoba County were involved in rampant evidence planting and manufacturing during the case against Avery, he always doubted the notion that the scattered bones found at Avery's burn pile pit were put there by the cops. For starters, Two of the biggest bones that were found turned up on the edge, not within the burn pit itself. Another reason why Bates didn't think the police put the bones there was because of Bear, Avery's mean and vicious junkyard dog. Bates said he had a chance to encounter Bear during his time working at a criminal as a criminal investigator for Strang and Beauty. Bear was the type of dog that would attack and constantly bark if a stranger or prowler even set foot on Avery's trailer property. The dog was on the metal chain and kept outside. The fact that the dog never went berserk leads Bates to believe that Teresa's bones were transported under the cloak of darkness from Bobby's yard to the burn pile pit where the barrel was spilled, but unknown to Bobby at the time. He failed to remove all of the bones, and that's why some of the bones remained at the bottom of his barrel when it was com confiscated by the Manitoba County Sheriff's Office on Sunday, November 6th. So, and if I could just interject here, sure. the, he's made a couple of very, very important points mm -hmm. here. Uh, and there's also a video uh, in which the uh, law enforcement are actually on the salvage yard this is uh, on November the 6th, right? And you can actually see a picture of Bear in the background. And Bear isn't barking, isn't being aggressive. He's just minding his own business. And the reason why is because he's become familiar with those individuals, <laughs> yep, that are on the property. So he's got no uh, reason to be aggressive, right? But Bates mentioned something very important right? And that is that bear, not bark or go berserk. Otherwise, uh, people would have been alerted. Alerted. Right? And that means that uh, whoever planted bones, bear must have known and, and paid no attention to that person at all, right? Guys, do you agree on the panel that uh, a dog, if a dog knows someone for a long period of time, they're not going to be barking and being aggressive. Guys, do you agree? Yeah. I agree. Get, unless the dog's got issues, absolutely. It's, it's going to Correct. know you and, and Correct. Be, Ma, be cool. Correct. Yeah, and my, guess Loki's like that. my Loki's like that dog. If he knows you, he'll smother you in kisses and cuddles and everything else. But if you're a stranger and you try and come near me, he'll growl at them, you yeah. know? Protected. So I can totally understand Bear's reaction or non-reaction. Um, it's got to have been somebody that he knew um, because he did not react. Correct. Correct. Otherwise, Steve would have heard something, right? And it's rather remarkable that, uh, and also very, very damning is the fact that some of the cremains were not in the burn pit, right? They were on the edge, on the grass, in the grass area of the burn pit. And most damning at all, guys, was that there were human cremains in yonder burn barrel number two, right? Uh, in, that's Bobby's burn barrel. That's Barb's burn barrel, right? 
And that caused a lot of problems for the state. And how did they overcome that problem? What did Mr. Kratz say? Mr. Kratz said, oh, Stephen couldn't break those bones, so he picked up the big, <laughs> the four biggest bones and decided to walk to his sister's burn barrel and just <laughs> dump them in there. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, Doc, yep. also, also keep in mind the Cuss Road and how that played a part. Oh, yeah. And not necessarily that we know of for sure on the 6th, but it, there's a dot, dot, dot to that because of what we know um, Fallon said in his re- his report, his uh, reply to Spring and Beauty about the clandestine burn site. And that was Cuff Road and finding bones. I, Correct. I, I, feel, I feel 100% convinced those, but whatever they found there was brought back to, to the yard. That's me. Correct. That's, my opinion. That's an opinion. Correct. Correct. <clears throat> Do we know when Bear was removed? What day was he removed? Uh, It was several days after November the 6th. I remember um, there's a phone call in which they called a vet to remove remove Bear. But Bear was there on November the 6th in which uh, I think it was Trooper Reese had taken those famous photographs of the burn pit, right? And to me... They are the only in situ photos that we know of the burn pit. And if you amplify up the photograph, you don't see any bone pile at all. You just see a thin layer of ash. Right? And a and shallow that, pit. Yep. And a very shallow pit. That is indeed yeah. damning. Yeah. But we've uh, Justin J. Um, has joined us in chat. Hello, Justin. Thanks for joining us. He says, as a cremation technician, I honestly cannot can't believe that body was cremated there. Neither can we. Neither Correct. can we. None of us believe that Teresa was burned on that burn pit. Um, we have all said the same with you, and it's good to have somebody who actually works in a Fantastic. crematorium. Actually yeah. join us on chat tonight. So um yeah. thank you very much for doing that, Justin. And we completely agree hundred percent. We don't believe it for a minute either. Correct. Yeah, please Correct. uh is it Justin or Justine? Please uh join Discord. We would love to pick your brain. Fantastic. Sorry, Beverly, Justine J. Yeah. Justine yeah. J. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so we'll drop a link, and if you'd like to join Discord, uh, you will be very popular for a while until we get all our answers from you. Correct, correct. And uh, Ronald Cass uh, talked about the fact that there were grass and weeds in the pit, right? And there were also a lot of leaves as well, which is indicative that there was no big, great whopping fire. And also that the seat, the large seat that was burnt, wasn't in the burn pit, but was on the periphery mm. of the burn pit. So there's a lot of issues with the burn pit. And remember, people like Kratz, they've got no other notion of where Teresa Horbach was cremated. They are of the opinion that she had to have been cremated in that burn pit and nowhere else. And there's no way that Kratz and his team could entertain the fact that Teresa Horbach uh, was dismembered, chopped up, cremated elsewhere, and someone had planted mm. the cremains back onto the property, right? So Bates is saying it's likely law enforcement planted some of those bones. And as Jack61 elegantly put out, there's evidence to suggest that there were human crema- or cremains found at Cuss Road in the uh, temporary burial site. And that in itself is very, very damning because that's in a report. That's in an official report, right? Um, And you can't get anything better than that. Awesome. Yep. Thank you. Shall we continue? Yeah. Okay. Bates said there were two dubious actions taken by Tadic and Bobby around the time of the crime that also factored into the suspicions that both men had something to do with the killing. 
The first was Bobby's first statement to the police on November 6th. That was when Bobby told Dietering he and Tadic both passed each other traveling on State Highway 147, but that the investigator should interview Tadic because Tadic would remember the area where they passed each other going in opposite directions on the two-lane state highway. It was very valuable for them to have a mutual alibi, Bates said. Again, that was so self-serving. Whoever Can I, told uh, Teresa... Yeah, sure. Yeah, can I just say, you know, I don't know what the rest of the panel and people in chat think, but um, does anyone find that rather suspicious? That at the time, That at the time Teresa Hallbach was last seen is also the time that Bobby and Scott Tadic alibi each other in the same area and at the same time. Does anybody find that suspicious at Jack 61? Raises his hand and says, yes. Uh, you know, I guess that, um, you know, just to, again, an opinion. Um, I have a real problem. I've always had a problem with the devil alibi because, you know, it, you can put anything down on paper, but you don't really have a lot of proof. And I'm not saying they're lying. I'm just saying it, it, it just, it looks really bad. Tied in with exactly what you said, Doc. It looks really bad. I call Correct. it convenient. As BB would I say. I call BS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Correct. he was and, so, uh, Bobby was so convincing when he said that, so confident when he said, oh, yeah, just ask Scott. And he will tell you exactly when and where that happened. Like, really? Correct. You know? Correct. And as someone, as someone had put out in the comment, there was also no coroner present. Uh, at the uh, um, burn pit, there was also no forensic anthropologist present Correct. at the burn pit. The only and there are no in situ pictures of any of the cremains at the burn pit or in yonder burn barrel number two. Right. Yeah. The only thing that we've got. Sorry, Jack sixty one. No, I, I'm just going to add in and everything you just listed there. That just leads in to say they could write any damn thing on paper and just say, hey. Judge and you know prosecutor, this is what we found, and you should believe us. But we can't really prove it, but you should believe us anyway. Bullshit. Correct, correct. Because Bennett was only handed a box of bones and asked, "Are these human? And who are they from? Right? Male, female, age. That's it." Uh, he was handed a box of bones, and shockingly, as we all know, uh, the state. Forensic anthropologist Dr. Eisenberg had never set foot on the Avery Salvage Yard, was never ever present. And we know how Deborah Kakech was treated, right? Ken Kratz said he only needed a coroner to kick the body, and that's it. Incredibly disrespectful. Yeah. And, you know, we talked many times about the, where, where is the tent, where is the grid. How did they collect that evidence? They put it all in the box, like a pizza box, right? And uh, right. gave it to Eisenberg, who was out of town or something like that. So three days, the box sat somewhere for three days. It's just the chain of um, custody uh, was a, really, really funky to be nice. You know, probably in a right. regular, uh, proper uh, trial that would be also all taken out because who took care of that? Where were the bones? Did they drop it off in front of her door? Was it in a evidence uh, collection department? I don't know. It just seems very, very um, not only amateur but uh, callous, casual, and uh, like they didn't give a care. Here's some bones. Tell us what you see. I don't know, you Correct. guys. And this is a human being we're talking about. Yeah. Correct. Alleg allegedly, Correct. Those, were, those were dropped off. Um, as Eisenberg was out of town, so they just dropped them off at, um, I think, the Dane, Dane County Coroner's Office. Basically, in a, just that box set there. And how disrespectful, as you just alluded to, if they truly believe that was Teresa, how disrespectful is that? Just You, you, you don't know where yeah. they were sitting at. They could have, for all we know, they could have been sitting right there at the door, a locked door to her office, you know? I don't know. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty terrible. Correct. 
Correct. And, you know, when John Erdl said they didn't take any photographs of the burn pit because it had been disturbed, uh, excuse me, you are the first guys there to examine the burn pit. How could it possibly have been disturbed, right? And so John Erdl, obviously, when he took one look at the burn pit, he knew that that was not in situ, right? It didn't look right, okay? So even he knew that something was really suspicious and they processed the burn pit area really quick, right? And when the sun went down, they all left, right? This is a major, major discovery and they all left, whereas at Cuss Road, yeah. the lights, a tarp, and that was all day. Yeah, they taped it off. They had a, was it ambulance or corner or something? They had all kinds of vehicles there. They even provided right. lunch or whatnot. It was all under control. This one, we had a skid steer, right? Correct. We had a Correct. skid steer. Yeah, as um, as Jack the one, yeah, as we've all discussed before, guys, uh, they brought in um, basically bobcats, and they completely flattened and removed the burn pit, which means that no one could, not even the jury, could go back and have a look at how small that burn pit area was, <laughs> right? And I wonder yeah. why. I wonder why they they did that, guys. <laughs> You, you know, Doc, talking about yeah. that, you were talking about Earl. You know, it was really bad when Fassbender emails him and says, hey, dude, where's the photos at of the burn pit? Fassbender Correct. asking, it, it, it was terrible it, just, and bullshit and shenanigans. And I've got to stop. I'm going to break, break my new iPad. I, I'll quit there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that, Jack61. Oh Are you correct? We've got a few questions on chat. Um, Pete Moss says, how could suck at this, rule it okay to give bones back when the law said evidence was to be retained irrespective of human or animal? Correct. Correct. He gave uh, this uh, nonsensical BS answer to that. Correct. Basically it's, a, it's inexplicable. That's what they said. It's inexplicable, yes. Correct, correct. So the way, that, the way they overcame that was incredible. So they basically argued, the courts argued, that since the uh, people that were involved in removing the cremains were not forensic anthropologists, they didn't have the expertise knowledge to determine what's animal and what's human. So therefore, the Horbach family could have been given deer bones animal bones, and too bad, right? And so the court ruled that there was no law uh, preservation of biological evidence uh, was broken because they couldn't prove that those cremains were human. Yet if you look at the CASA reports, every bag that was open contained cut, burnt human bones. So yeah. how on earth? Um, could anyone rule against that and say, no, 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 no laws were broken? So does that mean the Horbach family have buried animal bones and say, that's your daughter? Please. You know, that's yeah, beyond and, the joke. And uh, never, even, sorry. yes, I think Jack and I have, uh, we have this pet peeve about the, who requested the bones, why did, were the bones uh, returned all of a sudden because Jack, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there is no paper evidence that uh, Paul Bucks had re uh, requested those bones. That's one point. A second point is even though Judge Angie said, uh, well, how would they know they're not anthropologists? Then how could you even return it if you don't have the proper person there? to vet if this is a human or animal bone. You see what I'm saying? So they yeah. not only did it made a mistake and did that or uh, intentional, whatever it is, but they broke a law, but they didn't even attempt to have somebody, if they wanted to really return the bones out of the goodness of their hearts for closure or whatnot, uh, they should have had an anthropologist over there. 
but they didn't even bother with that, and now they're excused because they didn't have one. You see what I'm saying? So that's like a really, really some shenanigans going on. Dr. And Ross, I think it's all bullshit, by the way. Yeah, to answer the first part of your question, back last September, I sent a, a, an open records request to the DOJ asking for any and all communication between state authority, meaning, and I named off, you know, Kratz, the prosecutors, and uh, law, the law enforcement agencies, all of them, not just one, any and all communication between them and the hall box in and around um, the time frame, uh, you know, September of 2011. The reply I got, they denied my request. They didn't say they didn't have it. They just, they denied it and give a big lawyer, didn't pass the balancing act, balancing test, bullshit, blah, blah, blah. They didn't say there wasn't communication. They just wouldn't let me have it. That was the reply I got. Correct. And the cremains were given back in 2011. Um, a question was asked uh, in the chat. Um, and it's interesting that when Kathleen Zona had received the CASO report, the page indicating that the um, MTSO or Calumet had given back the cremains was missing. And it was a researcher, I believe, in Australia that alerted, that alerted Kathleen Zona that, hey, uh, there's no more cremains that have been given back to the Hallbach family. And hence why Kathleen Zona was really upset to say, you need to preserve biological evidence here. I want to retest those bones, right? So as soon as Stephen had lost his appeal, the state moved very, very quickly to give back those cremains because the state were aware that there were new technologies on the horizon or just out that could extract DNA from burnt cremains that didn't want to take the chance. Remarkable. So the cremains were given back. And Fallon had yanked Zellner's chain for over a year with those emails. Oh, we will. Let me look for them. Yes, we will. I'm out of office, whatever, for over a year. And finally, they gave him away. Okay. All right. Let's get back to the book. Okay. Let's get okay. back. Wait, 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 but, okay. But, before, but before, before we move to that, we can't forget about William's call about the bones. Remember Williams? Correct. Yeah. Oh, my God. What, what an opener. What a way to say. Hey, guys, I really went off this case. Let me make this really bad phone call to the defense counsel. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Correct. Straight yeah. to Zona. Yeah. All right, going back to this. Whoever killed Teresa also dismembered her body, removing her arms, her legs, her torso, Bates said. Trigger warning, guys. Most people don't realize that dismembering a body is an extremely messy and nasty job, Bates said. Unlike most of his family, Stephen Avery was not an avid hunter, Bates added. But on the other hand, Bobby and Tadich were both avid hunters and both men had substantial experience as the, in dismembering the carcasses of a dead deer, right? Both men claimed they were out deer hunting at separate locations around the time of Teresa's murder. However, in the aftermath of Teresa's disappearance, after the Manitoba County Sheriff's Office was becoming a regular presence on Avery Road investigating Teresa's disappearance, it seems Bobby took the initiative to scour the country roads and find a dead deer carcass, throw it in the back of the, his truck and bring it home. And then there's the next slide is the, a picture. In addition, he also made a point to visit one of the local convenience stores to make them aware of the deer carcass he retrieved. He obtained a deer tag, which also generated a paper trail, which was handy to have when the police arrived and sought to question him about the blood spatter in his garage. So in other words, Bobby got this deer, whether by accident or was he was, as uh, Bates said, he was looking for, you know, to hear that there was a dead deer on the road to get it. But then he took extra precautions by obtaining the tag for the deer, because I guess it's illegal to do it otherwise. 
Correct. So he had that on hand, which, yeah, so he can explain why is the deer um, hanging in his garage for a few days. Correct. I believe I'm not from Wisconsin. Uh, Maybe some of the panel members can help me. But uh, if you're caught poaching a deer, you can lose your hunting license and there's a big fine attached to it. Is that correct, guys? Yeah, and they can take your guns. They can do all kinds of shit to you. Yeah, it, it's pretty common here because deer are so prevalent in this area it's, and, and Wisconsin. Uh, if, if, it, if there's a deer strike and the, you know, the deer is, if it's not mangled up, you know, if it's not for all the pieces, you know, people, you know, to, to get the meat so it didn't go to waste, they can get it. They just have to get a tag for it. That you, you better right. if, you, if you're caught not doing it. Yeah, you can run into some. They can really come after you. Correct. I wonder why. I don't know anything about hunting, so I'm just being it's sincere po- with it, this it, question. It, it's poaching and, and over hunting. So the, because there's so many hunters in, in here and throughout the, the the Midwest, you know, it it's just a matter of population control trying to keep a handle on it. Because if they didn't, the deer population would be decimated. It's really popular yeah. game meat here. So, okay. Thank you. I just want to sure. point something out uh, regarding what uh, Bayet said about uh, dismembering the body, how an extremely messy and nasty job is. Guys, if we can cross-reference it with Robert Durst and Durst. what he yes said, and if you watch the the movie and the uh, the series, he talked about dismembering his neighbor, Mr. Black. His Maurice next door Black. Neighbor. Yes. Correct. He did it by himself and he said that it was an exhausting job. Exhausting job. Uh, not to mention about the blood and mess and guts and oh uh, yeah. So no kidding. But if you know how to do it and how join if you know the uh, anatomy of a body I think that, you know, the difference between a deer and a human body, of course, there's plenty. But for this purpose, I think, yeah, you have an advantage for knowing that. Where to cut. Where to cut. Where to cut, yes, exactly, because of the ligaments and tendons and joints and whatnot. And, you know, how to to get the guts out. Uh, Yeah. Correct. All All the visceral organs. Uh, yes. And all the visceral organs like the pancreas, the liver, the small and large intestine. intestine. You burn them, they're going to smell big time. You burn they hair, reek. you never are going to forget that smell. Has anyone ever singed their hair on their arms or their head accidentally? You could smell yes. it. It's got a very, very distinct smell. Which brings us to another point, everybody. Yeah. We know that there's bones of the her arms, pelvis and legs, right? And then we have right. uh, one or two pieces from her head, but the whole That's torso cut. is missing and most of the head and teeth and the Correct. hair and the gut. So, yeah, so that was conveniently missing and look at this deer, not to compare to Teresa, but all I'm saying, you see legs, you see uh, hind legs, front legs, rib cage, but no guts. They dressed the deer already. Everything's gone. Everything is gone. Yeah. So, um, I mean, not that I'm saying hunting is bad, but it's something I would never do. Is anyone on this pan- panel ever done hunting and dressing a deer? Anybody? Anybody in chat? My roommate does. Your roommate? Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Watched him do it last year. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. I, I think we might have a misunderstanding in chat. Um, Michelle Moore thought somebody here said that the hall box denied asking for the bones back. Someone say that. Uh, no, no, we never um, said that. No, uh-uh. no, no, uh-uh. no, 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 we this, never this, said this, that. No, the statement that I made never really asked a question about if there was any communication. And what I tried to find out, I sent an open records request to the DOJ to find out if there had been any communication between 
state authorities, that is prosecutors and law enforcement, and and even the county, between them and the Hallbox around the 2011 time frame. They denied my request. They didn't say it didn't exist. They just said I couldn't have it. Yes. No, it was, me, it was me that said about the Hallbacks denying um, the bonds because I'm sure I've heard that somewhere. I don't know if it's came from the other side or if it's came from Zellner or what because there is no trace or trail of how the bones got back. You know, there's not a, a report saying, oh, Mrs. Hallback came in and asked us for her bones back. You know, so that was de that, that's been denied that they never done that. So, I mean, I don't know if it's just something that I've heard along the lines or, or what. So that question to Michelle, that was me that put it in there about the, the bones. I'd answered that in chat. So I'm sorry if that's not true, but I'm sure I've heard something along those lines that there would have been something if the Hallbacks had asked for the bones back, you know, but th th there's nothing and it was denied that they even asked them to get them back. So not 100% on that, so don't quote me verbatim. Um, it was just something that I thought I heard. Well, we, yeah, the, the thing thing is we just don't know who initiated contact between either the hall box or the state we, we just don't know correct and you can't you can't just walk up to the hall box family and say surprise surprise look what we've got right clearly there had to be some form of communication from uh, law enforcement with the hall box family to say we're, we're letting you know that we're sending back the cremains that we've got you know out of respect so you can, um, you know, have closure, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't have access to that communication at all. And the cremains went to a funeral home first. I, I would dare say they would not just give back bones to a family. What they would do is either re-cremate them again, put them through a cremulator and convert it to dust and present an urn uh, that's representative of those cremains. They wouldn't give back bones. That's quite gross. They would put everything together uh, in an urn, so it's all like bone dust. The problem with that is, of course, you can never retest it again for DNA. So that opportunity is now gone. You've also yeah. got to remember as well, Doc, is that none of Stephen, Stephen wasn't told about the bones being back. His That's lawyers correct. and that weren't they told about the bones being handed back, which is the law. The law says that if a convict or anything like that is still doing time in prison and somebody wants something back that's biological, then it's got to go through their lawyers and they've also got to give permission for it to happen as well. Because as we say, we're in this situation where they're never going to be able to get tested. You know, so that's why the law was made. But they broke that and they broke all communication of the bones as well. So, Correct. yeah. Correct. And the way they overcame that was that in court, in court, Dr. Eisenberg was not prepared to call the pelvic bone in the Manitowoc County gravel pit as human. So, therefore, they were saying, what human bones? We didn't break any laws in the court. Our forensic anthropologists never called them as human bones, but suspect possible human. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, they were over. They were able to overcome that loophole, which is disgraceful when you think about it. And another thing, if you could uh, just confirm this, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but wasn't it gone? The state, uh, one of the prosecutors, there was, if you guys remember, it's been a while, there was Kratz, Gunn, and Fallon, right? So Gunn was the one who came up with that law of preservation yeah. of biological evidence. Right. He wrote the law for the state of Wisconsin, and they broke it. So think about that. That broke their own law. That broke their own yeah. law. Yeah. Okay. Shall we continue? Yeah. Okay. 
At 7.33 p.m. on Friday, November 4, authorities were notified that a deer was struck by a car just east of Larrabee. The following morning, the RAV4 was identified on the Avery property. A massive police presence took over Avery Road for the next eight consecutive days, and when the police opened Bobby's garage to look around, a dead deer carcass was strung up in the air. The deer, Bates said, was another perfect diversion to fool the police. When the police arrived, it appeared as if Bobby was kidding a deer. It was BS, Bates said, and if they dismembered the victim there, the police never did any forensic examination of the spot itself. Yikes. Bates suspected Bobby either saw the deer or heard it on the police scanner and ran out to get it as soon as he could. It would have been great for co covering up the blood, Bates said. Correct, correct. And I think during the trial, um, Bobby Dessie had said that he actually saw the deer being hit, right? Mm. Which, and when you think about, isn't that remarkable timing that Bobby yep. Dessie um, saw a deer being hit and it then ended up in his garage and it got dismembered, right? And the important thing is this, um, as uh, Neverly alluded to, you need the proper tools in order to cut up a human body, right? You need a special a meat, they're called like a meat saw. Uh, I know it's a horrible thing to talk about, but it's the same type of saw that you use on a deer that you would use on a human being. And if you were very observant of the very first photograph that we put up, with the deer carcass hanging down. If you have a look on the ground, what object do you see on the floor? Can anyone guess? The saw. A bone saw, which is the same saw that was used by Robert Durst. You, you, you buy them at a hardware store, right? And yeah. that's why, that's why they questioned Stephen Avery and also Chuck Avery when they went to Menards to see if they had bought cutting instruments, right? So they knew, the investigators knew that Teresa Horbach had been cut to pieces. They knew it, right? So yeah. the investigators go inside Bobby's garage and there's a deer completely gutted out with a bone saw, with blood everywhere. And as Neverly alluded to, no forensic testing of any of that blood. Now, if you see blood on the ground, can you tell the difference between human and deer blood? No, you can't. No. And then the most ironic and sad part is that Stephen Avery's trailer was there and his first neighbor is actually his sister, Barbara, right? So Bobby, Correct. who lived with his mom, was in his garage, had a deer hanging with all the tools that you could dismember the deer or a human being. There's blood in the garage, and they didn't pay any attention to that. Yet, they destroyed Stephen's garage, where there was no, not a speck of blood, nothing. They Correct. jackhammered it, they took everything out, allegedly, they marked everything, and then, you know, five months later, they find a bullet. They found, they found nothing, and they went through all of that trouble. But yet for Bobby, who needs an alibi and who needs to luminal? The, oh, they luminal Stevens' place, but they didn't Bobby's. No, that no, they didn't. No, they didn't. Yeah. which is quite shocking. Because Targeting one hundred and one. Yeah, they wanted correct. him, or else. Correct, which is remarkable because. Remember, uh, Jack 61, what the investigators were asking Brendan Dassey about the chains and the hooks in Stephen Avery's garage? That's right. And they said, and they said to Brendan, did you use any of those uh, chains or ropes hanging from the rafters? Hint, hint, right? And Brendan yeah. said, no. And no. fast bend and we get new that Teresa Orbach had been cut to pieces. And yet, in Bobby Dassey's garage, 
You've got a deer suspended from the rafters on hooks. You've got all the cutting instruments. You've got a dismembered deer. And no one put two and two together thinking, well, replace the deer with a human being. And there you go. You've got everything you need to cut up a human being. And none of them ever thought, maybe we better check in here just in case there's some human blood. <laughs> Nothing. Well, did they not think of it or did not did they not want to bother with it? Plus, you know, we have human bones in Bobby's burn barrel, Bone not barrel. Stevens, Bobby's. Correct. So everything Correct. pointed to Bobby, yet they, you know, tortured Stephen and Brendan. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't um, Bobby Dassey say, um, we burn the deer heads, we put them in the burn oh, barrel and burn them? Yes. Yeah, correct. Yes. Correct. Yes. So I guess when you hunters uh, can actually add to this, at one point, I actually say, have it saved on my phone as a picture. They asked Bobby... Um, Dietering interview partner, the Wisconsin DCI special agent Kevin Heimerl made an observation. They were talking to Bobby. He said, it sounds like you've skinned and butchered your own deer before. Bobby was 19 at the time, mind you. He said, yes, Bobby agreed. What would you normally do with the hide then? He goes, we took him into town. Oh, okay. Then Dietering wondered if the local butcher shop uh, accepted the deer head. And Bobby said, no, we'll just burn him, Bobby answered, over in the burning barrel. So burning barrel, Bobby burning stuff, Bobby dismembering, butchering beer or uh, deer or what's it called, dressing deer, the deer. And to them, that was all okay. Yet, you know, it's not for Stephen to have all the alibis, then that wasn't okay. That was very suspicious that Stephen had alibis, right? And didn't do a thing. They didn't find any evidence whatsoever. Even when Colburn went there, when, was it on the 3rd? And he goes, there was nothing to point into any struggle or anything like that. And Bobby has all of this going on, and yeah, he's free to go. Correct. Well, the, what is disturbing here, guys, is that all the material needed to dismember a human being was present in Bobby Dassey's garage. And there was no evidence at all in Stephen's garage of any form of dismemberment going on, right? And Robert Durr said that when he dismembered his next door neighbor, it was a very bloody, messy affair, right? And, and no physically exhausting. No top has got, and it took a long time to do it. Correct. He had to go okay. back to Home Depot again to get a bigger saw. A bigger saw. It's a Correct. serious, yeah. It's a serious business, you know, cutting up a god body. Yeah. <laughs> Not that we condone cutting up bodies <laughs> on the gym. No. Yeah. Yeah. We continue. Yeah. Okay. During the murder investigation, the, Dassey, the Dassies made police aware that they had lawfully taken the deer off the road, furnishing a tag they got at the local store to allow them to keep it. I think the deer being hit was a propitious incident. The deer gets hit and they take advantage of a situation that will help. They're always thinking of how can we cover up? That's a backup plan, and that's why they got it certified with a tag through the Department of Natural Resources, Bates said. Everything is covered. Bates said that the dismembering the body inside the garage would be the perfect place to do the dastardly act. The garage would be closed, and it offered the comfort of privacy, unlike taking apart the body out in the woods, for example. You do it in your garage. You will be able to control it. That's when it was done, and it was done in the burn barrels, he said. I think we should stop here to just uh, discuss this thing. What Bates was talking about, your Bobby allegedly 
was able to control the environment of what he was doing. He had the privacy and security of being in his own house behind the closed doors versus being somewhere in the woods where you can f have random people, whether walking, or driving, uh, or, hunters. you know, yeah, hunters or even workers in the quarry just, you know, coming and going and do going about their business. And you could be easily seen. This way, he controlled the environment, would have. I mean, it's possible and plausible, in my opinion. Yep, I agree. You need time and you need security, right? You don't yeah. want somebody walking up to you because um, remember, it was still daylight, okay? It was still daylight. Mama Avery could have gone over to Stephen's place. Um, in fact, she said she went over with the mail. Her um, Stephen's brothers could have gone over. Anybody could have gone over to visit. So therefore, you need to control the environment if you're dismembering a body, <laughs> right? Whereas and you have all the tools at your disposal because you're in your own garage. You have correct. buckets and tarps and paper and whatnot, you know, and not, you right. know, burning it outside, as you said, you know, it was Halloween. Kids were coming and going, you know, business going on at the end of the day. You know what I mean? We had people coming over. So this was, this could have been a perfect place to do something like this. Correct. And at the same time, of course, you have the butchered deer, right? So you know that some type of dismembering event actually took place in the Bobby Dassey's garage. There you go. Yeah. Joshua Dance affidavit indicates he saw a fire reminiscent of a burning barrel in the area of where Bobby Dassey lived. The electronic components of Miss Halbach's were burned in the Dassey burn barrel behind the residence at approximately 4.30 to 5 p.m. That fire was observed in the Dassey burn barrel by Joshua Dunt, Zellner's final living state. So, Susan, I think that you asked about Joshua Dunt, that he saw it. And, uh, yeah, and I always yeah. wonder, how could he be so precise you know, to see a fire and determine that it was uh, in a burn barrel versus just like a free burning fire. And uh, maybe the difference is, Dr. Silkman, will you explain this, please? Well, the what was very interesting was um, they actually took a, a, a camera to where Josh Redon stood and the closest to Josh Redont is the burn barrel belonging to Bob, right? Stephen's burn pit was further down, right? And um, Josh Redont describes a fire very similar to what you would get from a burn barrel, as in flames shooting straight up, as opposed to the burn pit. So from Josh Redont's perspective, the burn barrel because the younger family had, I believe, four burn barrels altogether. The cremains were found in Yonder burn barrel number two, right? So in one of the Yonder burn barrels, Josh Redont had a, a perfect line of sight to those burn barrels, right? So what he was describing was a burning event in the burn barrel as opposed to a fire in the burn pit, right? Now, and Stephen, they should know because that's like they do so that. usual. And They've seen that many, Josh many, Redon, many times. Josh Redon had burn barrels on his property as well. So he knew what a, a, what a fire from a burn barrel looks like, right? Uh, and so he could well have been describing the burn barrel fire, right, that night. Yeah. Right, And he was being pressured by law enforcement to make the fire bigger, higher, stronger, right, to match what Scott Tadich was saying to law enforcement, that it was a great big whopping fire. But for Josh Redont, he would have seen the burn barrel because Stephen Avery's yeah. burn pit was further away. Um, Jack61, do, do you have any comments on that one? What was the question again, Doc? I'm sorry. 
the question is that Josh Redont more likely saw the burn barrel fire oh. rather than from the burn pit. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that the cops encouraged him to answer a certain way, or the, the special agents, not necessarily the cops, but DCI agents, because, I mean, just listening to or, and reading you know, his affidavit and, and, and the different things he said, it just seemed like that they were after something different than what he actually told them. He was encouraged Correct. to answer, answer a certain way. Correct. And that's why he lawyered up, because he was like, whoa, what's going on over here? Yeah. And I don't blame him. Yeah, I don't either. Correct. So it all, it all now makes perfect sense that there was some type of burning event taking place in the, the yonder burn barrel, right? And that's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. We continue? Yeah. Faith said he's also pretty sure what was used to take apart Teresa's body. I think they used a meat saw, he said. Actually, dismembering a human body is not an easy task. It's extremely difficult. And if you get to take off the limbs, it's a nasty job. But if you've done this to a deer before, you're comfortable. Here are some of the key events of October 31st, 2005, concerning Bobby Das's behavior, as outlined by Zellner on August 9, 2018. Bobby had developed an obsession with Miss Halbach and on a number of occasions watched her from the, her residence and commented on her visits the next day. Remember how he would say, oh, is your girlfriend coming? Girlfriend, yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Mr. Avery did not leave the Dassey phone number with other trader because he was waiting for a return call on his cell phone or landline to confirm the appointment. Because Bobby was awake, he would have heard the voicemail message left by Ms. Halbach on the Dassey answering machine at 11.43 a.m. Bobby was the only person who could have listened to Ms. Halbach's voice message to the Dassey residence at 11.43 a.m. and known that Ms. Halbach did not have an address for the appointment. Bobby lied to the police when he denied knowing that on October 31st, 2005, Ms. Halbach was coming to the property. Bobby told police that he saw Ms. Halbach by her vehicle for approximately 10 seconds. However, Bobby was able to describe Ms. Halbach's clothing, physique, and hairstyle, indicating that he had more direct contact with Ms. Halbach than simply seeing her out of his window for 10 seconds. The DASI computer internet browsing data indicates that 22 pornographic searches were made on October 31st, 2005. Bobby's computer was in use on October 31st, 2005, which impeaches his trial testimony that he was asleep from 6.30 to 2 p.m. The computer was used to access the internet on October 31st, 2005 at 6.05 a.m., 6.28 a.m., 6.31 a.m., 7 a.m., 9.33 a.m., 10.09 a.m., 1.08 p.m., and 1.51 p.m. As Miss Holbox left the property, Bobby followed her in his blazer. Maybe we should stop here and uh, go over this. Yeah, which Remember? is very Bobby, yes. Bobby said, understand, that he works nights and that he slept in the morning and got up at two o'clock, took a shower, saw Teresa and uh, went uh, bow hunting, right? Correct. So if you take Correct. into consideration that his mother, Barb, went to work, his two brothers, Blaine and Brandon, went to school, and um, the oldest brother, actually, he never lived there. He would just come and do the laundry or exchange pick up what he needed. He didn't live there because he actually didn't like Scott Tadich. And he didn't like the fact that Barbara was messing with Scott Tadich while she was still legally married to their dad. So he just went with his girlfriend and it would only occasionally come over. So Bobby was home alone when 
these searches at you know between 605 and 151 almost two o'clock were made and nobody else was home so who could it be correct correct and uh, as you know uh, this is exactly what's in kathleen zona's uh, latest filing about the vlecd uh, and when those porn searches were were done and uh, i didn't even realize but according to what um uh, is written here there were 22 pornographic searches on that day right and it yeah. just so happens that um, that when you look at the timing bobby desi said that he was asleep uh that clearly cannot be the case and it now begs the question was he aware that Teresa Horbach was actually coming to the property to take photographs? Because when you think about it, another coincidence, right guys, that as he happened to be looking out his kitchen window, up pops Teresa Horbach, right? Uh, and what is remarkable is that Bobby Dassey was able to give a perfect description of what she was wearing. In fact, a better Correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but apparently a better description than what Stephen was able to give. Yes. That's right. And, and that's he not even too said bad. that she wore like a spring coat or something like that. I'm like, how would a 19-year-old know what's a, what a spring coat is? You know Correct. what I mean? That's kind of pretty particular. And that's not too bad for a tense, uh, an allegedly a 10-second viewing of Teresa Horbach. But what is disturbing is that Bob Dassey must have absolutely known that there was a photographer coming because didn't he, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't he help Stephen fix up the van, clean up the van? Yeah. Right? So he definitely Char knew it was for Char sale. Charge the battery. Correct. Yeah, and Blaine also helped out for the same purpose that they were talking about it. Correct. Correct. And also... I don't know if this is uh, if this has been debunked, but allegedly Scott Tadich was there at noon. I think that Stephen I said. I heard that. Yeah. Does anyone know whether that has been noon. confirmed? Has that been confirmed that Scott Tadich was there as well? I don't think so, Doc and Everly. I, I I remember that you know that um, I think that was part of uh, Kathleen's uh, scenario, uh, and, and you know. Um, possibility, whatever, uh, but I don't think that's proven. Okay. Okay. Correct. Correct. And there were questions in the audience uh, in chat about burning uh, different types of flesh. Um, everything I've, I've never, never seen or, or smelt a, a, a burning human body, but everyone who says that they have, especially firefighters and people involved in first uh, first responders said that it's a smell that's extremely diagnostic you're never going to forget it but here's the issue if you're burning um flesh from an animal and flesh from a human being you may mask some of that smell right but here's the kicker it's going to be very very smelly if you co-burn the viscera, the internal organs, right? So potentially what could have been done is that the internal organs were put in a bag and dumped elsewhere. Because I remember yeah. a lot of the hunters were saying that when they gut a deer, they have to leave the intestines where they gut the deer. And when the hunter goes back the next day, it's all gone. Wild animals come in and consume everything, right? So the last thing you want to do is burn the intestines and the, the guts, the liver, the pancreas, all of those viscera. It's going to be a very potent smell, right? So if you co-burn limbs, right, just muscle tissue with fat and things like that, and you co-burn it uh, with animal, uh, you may not detect anything nefarious, if you know what I mean. But certainly if you're burning the torso, <laughs> that's huge. The torso with all the major organs in it, that's massive. Th that would definitely give 
a distinctive mm-hmm. spell. But if, if I may say something, if Teresa, if you go along with a state with Kratz's story, because to me that's nothing but a story, that Teresa was burned in a hole in the burn pit. Correct. Somebody would have smelled something. There's so oh, many no. people on that property and no surrounding doubt. the property. Somebody would have said something. Even if Steve, you know, because we're talking a particular day, you know, Teresa disappeared, the whole world knew that she disappeared on the 31st. You know, investigators are going around, missing posters, people are talking. It's a small community. You know, somebody would have said, oh, yeah, no, I remember Stephen was cooking barbecue, something. Something that he was doing, something that would be a significant event. And you could smell burgers, you know, uh hot dogs or what vegetables whatnot nobody but to nobody burn a nobody body mentioned any, no nobody nothing, yeah nobody mentioned any nothing smoke. was burning yes uh, susan yes. do you have a comment and, oh. yeah i think earlier bates had said that um he was talking about bobby burning the electronics um in the burn yes. barrel I, I don't know that he said that bobby burned teresa on his property there no no no, no, but the states, the states said that. Oh, I know Trust that. Said, yeah. But the fact yeah, that yeah. there Trust was said. no, li- the fact there was no lingering odor on the property, I Nothing. think, um, tells us that Teresa was not burnt on the property there. I agree. I agree. But what I what what I think did occur, uh, there's only a, a hypothesis. I've got no proof that she was chopped up there put into bags and transported somewhere else and burnt, right? That's you don't possible. Burn someone, you don't burn someone on your own property. What Robert no. Durst did was that he put all the limbs in different plastic bags, put them in a carry bag and took them to a river and dumped them, right? Threw them in so the bay, yeah. That's <laughs> it, threw them in the bay. So, but what he did was he wrapped up all the limbs in separate bags so it's easy to transport. And he said that the hardest thing to transport was the torso because it's so heavy and it's got all the major organs. The limbs, including the head, piece of cake, no problems at all. But the torso represented a big problem. But Teresa was not a big person, right? So if you hide everything in a burn barrel, are you going to see it? No, you're not. It's disguised. But if you burn a human being in an open burn pit, you will definitely see it. No one saw a thing. See it and smell it. Yes, absolutely. 100% correct. 100% correct. Yeah. Uh, Jack61, did you and- have a comment? Well, just to add to and you know, a, a further comment, uh, I, I'm like you guys. I think that she was burned off property, probably on the quarry in a temporary grave dug at Cuss Road for you know, just for short time keeping. Um, but I think that even if, um, let's just say that hypothetically, allegedly, she was burnt uh, in pieces in the pit uh, without the organs, just the meat and the skin, you would have still smelled it and it was still permeated everything. Exactly. Correct. Correct. Uh, the burning, especially the burning of human hair, you can't, it's very, very distinctive. Sorry, Neverly, keep going, keep going. No, I will, you know, we know, I know when my neighbors are making a barbecue because you can smell it. Correct. You can smell stuff. Nobody smelled anything except for, was it um, Earl's friend? What's his name? Robert uh, Fabian, who said, oh, yeah, I smelled uh, the burning electronics of like for two seconds or something stupid like that, right? So he could recall that information. Trust me, people from uh, surrounding counties would know about a burning body. Well, not counties, you know, I'm being dramatic, but you know what I mean. And another point, Dark Side of the Moon actually said that Kathleen Zellner did a, remember a few years ago when she did a Q&A on Twitter? She posted herself. She said that on October 31st, 2005, Scott Tadich visited Bobby at the Avery Salvage Yard around noon she was the one who said it yes 
because I think that Steven said I saw his truck in front of the that's garage. That's what he said. Bobby's that's garage. Said. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Mark. Mark. Moss has joined us. Moss Call has joined us in chat. Hi, Moss. Nice to see you. Hope you're keeping well. He says, hey, I've Mom. smelled. I've smelled it. My neighbor burned 90% of his body and you can oh. smell it for weeks. Oh, God. Correct. And when you think about it, there was no lingering smell on any of the clothing, right? Could you imagine Brendan Dassey going home with all the, with all the um, aroma attached to his clothes? It would have been incredibly distinctive, right? He would have and reeked. the other thing, of course, he would have reeked, Doc. He would have, his clothes would have reeked. That's correct. That look, I've cooked plenty of barbecues, right? Legal barbecues, <laughs> you know. And the fat, the oil, it sticks to your clothing, right? And you could smell it. You could smell it even a couple of days after. It gets in your skin. It gets in your hair, right? And the other thing, of course, no one ever said that bear went bananas and started barking nonstop for an hour or two hours because Bear would have smelled, oh, my God, this is incredible. And dogs have got an incredible sense of smell, right? 200 oh, yeah. times more powerful than a human being, if not more. He definitely would have smelled something really strange going on, uh, the burning of a human body. No one ever mentioned that Bear started barking for hours on end. And no one mentioned ever, including Scott Tadich, the nefarious smell of a human being, right? Yeah. And the state, the state said Teresa Horbach was burnt whole, not cut up, whole in the burn pit. What did Brendan Dassey say? I held her legs, Stephen held, held her shoulders, and we put her on the fire whole. That's not the case, guys. We yeah. know that's not the case. Yeah. Interesting comment in the chat uh, from Justine J, who just joined. She is the one that uh, works in a crematorium. She says, I still think she was taken and cremated properly. Then some cremains were removed and moved to the barrels to incriminate Stephen. Could be because the size of the cremains is what trips everybody up. It's like too small for, I mean, how many hours did they burn her for? You know what I mean? Because they look to me just like the regular cremains from a proper crem cremation, just not bleached. No, correct, correct. But there's, one, there's, one thing, there's one thing that suggests she wasn't professionally cremated. And that's item BZ. Yeah. The fact that there were some right. bone fragments that's right. with, with that's muscle right. tissue, right? And I, I've right. seen I've seen professional cremations take place. There's no muscle tissue left. It's all gone. It is just bone fragments. The mere fact of that um, Eisenberg described uh, muscle pieces of muscle that had survived, and that's what Colhane right. used for DNA analysis indicates to me there's no way that she was cremated in a professional crematorium. Furthermore, um, where's the other 60% of the skeletal remains? They're missing, right? The in Remember, the entire human skeleton has not been found. Only around about 35 to 40%. The rest is missing, right? No one knows where it is. And if you think about it, does that mean that the torso was dumped somewhere else, right? Because the torso has got a lot of bones. They hardly found any of the spinal column, right? And the or ribs. No ribs. No ribs. Very small, very small, tiny fragments. There's something crazy. And they only found about 35% of the skull, I think, Jack 61, yeah. if that's correct. They yeah. didn't find the entire skull. And they found no teeth, no no intact teeth. All the crowns were gone. All the crowns were gone. So something really bizarre took place, unfortunately. Hey, Doc, uh, yeah, to, no, to, to, add to, to add to your comment, I'm sorry, Alice, just one brief second. 
add to your, uh, your question a few minutes ago about if Scott Tadic was on the property at noon. Dark Side of the Moon put a tweet that Zellner had posted. Um, I don't um, I don't have a date of the, of the tweet, but it says, from Kathleen Zellner, on 10-31-05, Scott Tadic visited Bobby at the Avery Salvage Yard around noon. That's all it says. Okay. Okay. And and yet, two hours or so later, they are alibying each other. All right? That's scary. And, yeah, in this book, they said, and I read it already, that Bobby said, I took a shower and I went, um, you can ask Scott Tadic or something like that, if he can alibi at where we actually cross paths because the yes the time and the place also because we both went uh, deer hunting where in fact bobby then said that he went bow hunting which refers to geese not deer yeah. no uh, no it's deer as well it was the first day i believe of bow hunting season on deer okay but he also does hunt geese as well. So so he went deer hunting using a bow. Oh, yeah. okay. It must be a oh. sharp bow. Yeah, they're very oh, yeah. dangerous. Oh, they're yeah. very dangerous. Uh, yeah, Alice, um, oh, one other oh, thing sorry. that they didn't find, Doc, in the barn pit is the ashes. Uh, correct. Yeah. And also, also no Any ashes. Also no pyrolysis, which is the black exactly. goo. Exactly that you find yeah. at, the, at, the, at the bottom, that normally will be on the mm -hmm. bottom layer, uh, that's distinct, that's organic material indicative that a human being has been burnt uh, in that particular spot. Um, I, I know that one of the, I know, I know there's comments in the chat, I know that one of the law enforcement officers did uh, have a, um, a crematorium, the family had a crematorium, but by oh, God, that, that's extremely risky to take a body without any documentation, cremate it, remove the cremains, and then transport them back to the property uh, to frame Stephen Avery. That's way, way too risky, in my, just in my opinion. And if we're blaming Bobby Dassey for having cremated Teresa Horbach, it makes sense that he is the planter of the cremains, but that doesn't mean that law enforcement didn't find cremains at cars and took them back to the property, right? But Kathleen Zone is very, very cautious, correct, Jack61? And panel, she's very cautious this time. She's not mentioning law enforcement nope. at all nope. and focusing on one Denny suspect, Bobby Dassey. Uh, and isn't it remarkable that in this chapter, it all pans out perfectly. It's not looking good. Yeah, other, than, yeah, yeah. other, other than keeping the call uh, basically under wraps for 17 years. <laughs> no, other than that, she's really not. She's staying laser focused on Bobby. But it, it, it's, um, it's very straightforward. It's not a huge amount of detail. To be attacked on. Correct. Uh, we Justin, still we Justin still did. have to remember. Sorry, we have to remember that this is all speculation. Correct. You know, this is not. Yes. Correct. Exactly what went down. It's speculation. So. Hundred percent correct. Different right. scenarios. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Correct. We are not and, accusing yeah. and, anyone. No. This is the what he thought as the investigator. He spent time and effort to investigate what was happening. So these are his conclusions of uh, Mr. Bates. We're not saying this or anything. We're just discussing of what we know uh, based on what uh, was written in this book, what Bates said. That's all. You're right. Thank you, Susan. Correct. Uh, Alice, did you have a comment? Justine J says in chat, she says, you can remove a piece 
while it is being cremated, you're not allowed to touch a body when being cremated, but it wouldn't stop them. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree. My feeling, though, is that um, now Dahan, who's a fire expert, has seen bodies, human bodies, uh, cadavers being burnt in a burn barrel, uh, and definitely a burn barrel can reach the right temperatures to cremate a human body and convert them to bones, bone fragments. Because what happened to Teresa Horbach is indicative of the use of a lot of fuel, a lot of time, and direct heat, which is exactly what you have in a crematorium. But you can also replicate it in a burn barrel, no problems. And if you chop up a human being into smaller fragments, that means that there's no problems about the heat getting towards it. But if you pack those um, human limbs with other things as well in the burn barrel, you can protect, potentially protect part of those uh, body parts from direct fire, which means that that would explain why there will be some muscle tissue left over and the muscle tissue itself was heavily burnt and charred, right? But some of it survived, and Cohen was able to extract DNA from it. In a professional crematorium, you're not going to have nothing left but bone fragments. No meat, uh, no organic material. The bones are all dried out. Uh, they're white. They're calcined because of the high temperatures. You're going to have nothing left but bone fragments. And... As you know, I'm not not telling any anything that, um, that Justin doesn't know. They also use a large metal object to crunch the bones, because some of the larger bones, like your skull and the pelvic bones, and also the cer cervical, the spinal column, are resistant to burning. So you need to smash them down, right? So yes, a crematorium would do it, but I don't think in this case a crematorium was used. Just an opinion. Can I make a comment on that tweet of Kathleen? Yes, yes. About Scott, Scott Toddick being there. Um, I'm not sure where she got that information, um, if it was Stephen, which Stephen didn't say that in any of his interviews. But she's also relying on someone's memory and how anybody can pinpoint that day and exactly, you know, Scott could have been there the day after, the day before, you know. Um, I, I just can't rely on that very much. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. And Scott Tadich was there in the evening because he uh, dropped off Barb and picked up Barb and uh, he witnessed the fire. And I think he also recalled seeing Brendan Dassey, one of the Dassey boys near the fire. So he was definitely there. But it's very easy to get the time wrong as well correct at, I, yeah at noon is a whole different thing um at, no, at yeah. noon it is oh yes it, it's highly highly suspicious because bobby's meant yeah. to be sleeping right correct yeah and and if you know if like stephen suddenly remembered that and told casey it doesn't mean his memory is accurate for that day is all i'm saying just being devil's advocate no, no, it's correct. And, you know, you can't even go by what Scott says because, A, he lies often. B, at one point he said, I was there, and then he said, I wasn't there. Then he said, I went to visit his mom, Then it, or went to work, or it proves, and it was proven not to be true, at least not the timeline that he provided. So uh, we don't know. We're doing uh, the best that we can. I was going to comment directly to that, Neverly, and, and to actually to what Susan mm -hmm. said, too, because... Here's the thing. The first statement that he made, um, well, he made two statements, one on November 10th, 2005, the other one 19 days later on November 29th. And I get them confused. But in one of these statements, he didn't work. He went to Green Bay because his mom was having back surgery. The other statement, he did work. He came home, changed clothes. Um, yes. Remember? Went hunting. Went hunting. Yes, and then went hunting. Went Went and picked Barb up and ran to Green Bay to visit his mom. So there's two different stories there. So if she's taken from one of those days that he actually said he was off, hell, he was free. He could have been at the salvage yard. But I don't, I've don't. i never seen mm -hmm. any cooperation to that. I have to agree with 
with Susan. I need some cooperation or I completely buy that. Just, I, I just learned something from Justine. Is that what you were going to read about the ashes? Yeah, it was, Susan. Yeah, on you go. Yeah, that's something I just learned. Uh, all bones remain after cremation and need cremulating at the end of a cremation to create ashes as we know them. Correct. I was not aware of that. I thought some of them turned to ash. Uh, um, no, no, it's they very... They grind them. They grind them. So basically, um, yeah. once once the once the cremation event takes place, you've got all the bone fragments. They use a big metal prong to crunch some of the larger bones. They scrape them in a metal container, and then they place them in a cremulator. And a cremulator contains, I think, um, iron around balls that help uh, crunch the bones. And at the end of the cremulation, you have a fine dust fine powder and that's the ashes that they put in an urn right so the right. bones need to but, be crunched further down correct but do some of the bones <clears throat> completely turn in these little tiny pieces they found um bone fragments correct after correct. after just being burned they can just crumble like that uh but no not 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 all the tiny bone fragments that we see uh, in, th in the box of bones, in the box of bones, most of those bone fragments are about the size of your thumbnail. I think the largest bone was maybe one or two inches. They were all small bone fragments. But if you see a cremation, you need to use, like I said, a metal bar to crunch them even further because some of the skull yeah. fragments are quite large. They're several inches across because we've got sutures in our skull and a lot of those bone fragments still are intact. So you need to crunch them, collect them, place them in a cremulator. Correct. So so I guess it was Kratz that said uh, Stephen used the shovel to, um, cut the explain, bones. to mm -hmm. explain away how they were in such tiny little pieces. Correct. Well, that would yeah. make sense if they were just like, you know, trying to compress the body also, you know what I mean, by crushing it? Oh, that would make sense. Just, yeah, Justine, Justine says bones become calcified and brittle and Correct. no, they don't use a metal bar. Okay. That's interesting. The uh, cremation I videos that I've seen, they use a long metal bar, sort of like oh. it's with a T-junction and they use it to, to crunch. But you're correct. If you have a look at some of the bones that were recovered uh, of Teresa Horbach, some of them were white and calcined. Others were a different color. That's indicative that the bones were exposed to very, very high heat. And hence, all the organic matter in the bone, the bone marrow, the biological material has all evaporated away. And the bone, you're correct, is actually quite brittle. It almost looks like porcelain, right? It's got the appearance of porcelain. Correct. I have one comment, and, you know, I don't, nobody hit me. I, I wear glasses, and uh, I have burp, my birthday tomorrow, so I, no hitting. I'm just throwing this out there. Occam's razor time, and where we're located at, and where a lot of this material was, and knowing that there was a rock crusher right there. Just saying. Pressure. Yes, yes, yes. If you if you mix those bones with the rocks, you're never going to find it. You oh, are right. never going to find that individual at all, right? So, because so, there's so some, a, yeah, some of the stuff is missing that we you know we, you you've outlined very well. And who's to say that that shit didn't get run through that damn crusher and we no one would ever know. Correct, correct, uh, but. As as we've all seen, the only thing that was found were tiny bone fragments, uh, and the entire skeletal um, frame was not found. Right. Right. That. And if you burn someone in situ, even Justin uh, or Justine will admit, if you burn someone in situ, <laughs> all the bones are there in that one spot. You're not going to find cremains in a burn barrel. You're not going to find cremains on Cuss Road, 
and you're not going to find cremains dumped in piles in the Manitowoc County gravel pit, all the cremains are going to be in situ in one spot, <laughs> right? So there's something weird going on with those cremains. And another thing, Doc, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there was no real odour uh, to those cremains from what Eisenberg reported. Is, is that right? Uh, can you say that again, Jack? There, there, there was no real odour to the cremains that Eisenberg That's them. correct. That's correct. And furthermore, they found no rubber residue, right, because the state was saying that Teresa Hobart was co-burned with tyres. They found no rubber residue or smell of rubber or um, petrol, gasoline or something like that on the cremains, which is very, very interesting. So there was no distinctive odour nor rubber uh, residue. Correct. Neville, would you like to continue? Re I think what we'll do um, is read maybe a couple of more pages and we'll call it quits. Is everyone happy with that? Yeah. We've actually gone for we've actually gone for quite a while. We've had yeah. some incredible discussion. Sounds good. Is that, is that is that good? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to read maybe, Doctor Sokman? English is my second language. Or would someone else like to uh, take over? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Susan, Alice. Anybody? Would you like to read the next couple of pages? I have a mouthful of pizza right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you brag! I want some. Uh, who would like to? Who would like to read? Are we on? Uh, we're actually. Are we on? Have you finished? Uh, we are page at 10 the maybe? bottom. No, I can. I can continue. It's yeah, page finish, ten. Finish and page the bottom. ten. Yes. Finish page okay. ten. Well, it's only like one. Uh, sentence. As Miss Halbach left the property, Bobby followed her in his blazer. Miss Halbach's cell phone re re record records indicate that she had left the Avery property by 2.41 p.m. and headed west on State Highway 147 and south on Country Highway Q. It was established at trial that Miss Halbach frequently did hustle shots because Bobby lied about following Miss Halbach's from the Avery property, he most likely is the person who waved her down for a hustle shot. Miss Halbach was in the area of Cuss Road, so it is a reasonable inference that she stopped her vehicle for the hustle shot and the Cuss Road cul-de-sac. Now, isn't it the interesting, blood? if I could just say, isn't it interesting yeah, that sure. Kathleen Zona made the point that there was communication between Bobby Dassey and Teresa Orbach that was non-telephonic. Yes, good point. So what, what, what do you think happened? Yes. He's waving something down, communication, with, and it's non-telephonic. Yes. Good Only point. Spe Only speculation, of course. Now, before everyone jumps up and down and goes, oh, come on, Teresa Orbach's going to stop. Well, think about it. Bobby Dassey had the absolute perfect excuse. And all he had to say, if Teresa wound down her window, was, um, hi, uh, you were just at my property at the salvage yard photographing my mother's vehicle, the brown van. Are you able to do a hustle shot of something, blah, blah, blah? And Teresa Horbach would have said, oh, yeah, that's right. I just did a shot of your mother's van, and hence you've got that element of trust that what Bobby's saying is in actual fact correct, right? I don't think Teresa would have stopped for any random stranger, but Bobby would have had a legitimate excuse or reason to say, hey, look, can you do a hustle shot? And to correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but Teresa Horbach used to do plenty of hustle shots. Oh, absolutely, she did. Yeah, because she paid like eighteen dollars versus eight that she would go if she got it through Auto Trader. Correct, correct. Yeah. Okay. Do you, do you would you like to finish the page? Sure. The blood spatter 
on the inside of the RAV4 cargo door demonstrates that a struggle ensued between Ms. Holbach and her attacker. The dog alerts indicate that Ms. Holbach was in the area of the suspected burial site for a period of time where she may have been assaulted. The scientific testing by Zellner's crew of world-renowned experts validates her position that the killer put Teresa's unconscious body into the back of the Teresa's vehicle and drove the sports utility vehicle back to Avery Road near 4 p.m. The hair bloodstain patterns were created by Ms. Halbach being placed in the rear cargo area of the RAV4 and her injured head bouncing on the inside panel as the RAV4 was moving. It is a reasonable inference that Ms. Holbach and her vehicle were brought back to the Avery salvage yard after she left the property the first time. There are two supporting eyewitnesses who back up her theory. One individual is John Larkin, who was a propane truck driver for Valder's Co-op, who spent time on Avery's property on Halloween. He was called as a defense team witness by Strang and Buting. He testified matter-of-factly that a vehicle similar to Ms. Holbach's drove past him at 3.45 to 3.50 p.m. Mr. Lurkwin was uncertain whether the driver was male or female or which direction the vehicle turned as it exited the Avery property. During the trial, Lurkwin testified he loaded his propane truck for commercial and residential customer deliveries on the southeast corner of Avery Road and 147. His work schedule was 7.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Buting. Now on October 31st, 2005, do you recall seeing any particular vehicle that later, later it became of interest to you? Uh, yes, I recall seeing a green SUV. Oh, sorry, that was my Siri. Uh, yes, I recall seeing a green SUV, a mid-size SUV, not the large size. It was smaller. Beauty. Oh, okay, so tell us what you saw. I seen a vehicle pass by the front of my truck, and I just glanced up, and it was a green SUV, and that's all. Beauty. Well, which direction was it going? Back towards Avery Road. So that would be to the north. I mean, towards 147. It was leaving. Yes. It was leaving Avery Road. Yep. Yeah, now, is When asked on the witness, yes. When asked on the witness stand if he was a friend of the Averys, the witness testified, no. Did you happen to see which direction that green SUV went when it got to the intersection of Highway 147? No, I did not pay attention. Go ahead, Dr. Silton. Well, isn't that remarkable that um, John LeCourne, who um, the propane tanks are at the very end of Avery Road. So any vehicle coming in and coming out of uh, the Avery property, he would have seen, right? And it's remarkable that he saw a vehicle and obviously that looked like Teresa Horbach's car and he described it as green, right? And uh, before everyone jumps up and down and says, hey, two RAVs. No, 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 no. We've demonstrated that depending on the lighting conditions, Teresa Horbach's vehicle can either look green or blue. <laughs> and I've done direct comparisons of the same vehicle uh, under the lights of the crime lab and outside. Under the lights of the crime lab, it's a beautiful blue. Under the light of the sunlight, it looks green. And what did uh, Teresa's mum call the vehicle? <laughs> green, most mainly green. And what was on the missing girl poster, woman's poster? Green. Dark green, right? And Everybody actually called it green except for Kraft. Uh, correct. He made a correct. point of, to call it blue seal or whatever he called it. Uh, correct. Something correct. Blue, blue. Yeah. In actual fact, I think Bobby Dassey called it teal, teal, blue. teal, teal. blue. <laughs> yep, correct. Because he was coached like, by Kratz. Yes. So tell me, guys, um, is anyone slightly suspicious of John LeCourne seeing a vehicle looking like Teresa Horbach's car 
coming out at that particular time? Anybody suspicious? It's no, I think she was honest. Yeah, yeah. It's damning. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. And Neverly, Neverly, continue. Neverly. What do you mean to read? To read? No, no, no. Did you have a comment about John Le Quang? Oh, I didn't want to cut Jack off. Yeah, I think he was honest. I don't that he said what he saw. He didn't come. He didn't go into great details. He saw a green small SUV leaving Avery's property around three fifty. That's what he said, right? Correct. Correct. A uh, Jack sixty one. Yeah, I, I think his clock was off. Personally, an hour. I think he hadn't set his clock yes. back. Yes, that's what I think. Uh, I, I do yep. think. He he didn't really have any uh, any gain by uh, not being truthful. He saw what he saw and, and he reported. It. I just think his clock was not set back an hour. Um, uh, and I'm also remind, I'm also reminded again, and this has all happened. It's re relevant to the the current filing. There has been another person that's been identified by um, someone in within the community. It's a second bus driver that said she saw Teresa. Uh, at a certain point, uh, she was she's a school bus driver, not not Lisa. This is a different. No, one. Lisa Booker, another right. one. This right, is Tammy Bent. Right, and she allegedly made a call MTSO and reported this tip, and we don't have the call, not that I'm aware of, anyway. Correct, correct. And Jack sixty one, you made a good point. Was John wasn't there daylight saving time? That's right. The very same day or the day prior. The day prior. So if John Lequin forgot to change his clock, it now makes perfect sense that he saw Teresa Horbach at about 2.45-ish leave the property, which is when Stephen said, yeah, I saw her leave, and she turned left on Highway 147. As John Lequin never said he saw the school bus drive in, right? That's so right. it's very interesting that John LeQuern simply could have forgotten to change his time and was out by an hour. So that's what, John that's what I think. He's a direct witness of Teresa leaving the property. And Neverly, did you have a comment? Yes, that's a very, very possible because we always wondered about that because What's his name? Kratz? You know, Stephen was guilty around 2.30 and Brandon was guilty around, you know, 3.30, right? We had always that one hour of a gap. So for Mr. John LeQuinn, that could be uh, one possibility. But then what goes on in this chapter, it kind of also makes sense. So I don't know what to think. Correct. Does now, proceed or should we leave it uh, for another time correct but think about it according to the state Teresa and her suv never left the property yes never so what is john lequern seeing how many how many how many toyota rav4s are there that are coming in and out of the property right at that time on that day at that yeah time, at that day and that brings everything close together with Tom Sawinski's observation as well. Well, look, guys, I reckon we do one more page and we'll call it quits. Is just, everyone happy okay. with it? Yeah, just one more comment about John. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a point worth making. And you, and you said it, Doc. If he had been there at 345, as like you, I think I personally think he missed the, his clock was wrong. He would have seen the school bus when uh, Blaine and Brendan got home. There's no doubt about it. He's right there, and they never question, they never fucking questioned him about it. I think his clock was wrong. They let it go, thinking, "Hey, look at here, what we got," and didn't bring correct. it correct. So, hundred percent correct. However, however, look what he said. He was sitting at that gas station. He was pumping the gas in his truck right around right. 3 50 because he works till four o'clock so it makes me think that he's correct on the time see what he said a vehicle okay 
could he could have been off all day. I, I'm just I don't know that I'm, I'm not I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to be argumentative. I promise. I'm just yeah, saying. So that, he, no, no, no. I, it's not an argument. I'm just thinking. Also, if he was ready to get to go home, that was about that time because he only worked till four o'clock. That's what he correct, said. Correct. You know what I mean? He, he, then but why did he never change his clock? Bus, bus driver. I don't know. Yeah, but yeah. if he never oh, changed I see. all day long. Yeah. Yeah, he never yes. changed his clock. He was an hour out all day, right? He was an hour eight late all day. He was an hour out. That's right. That's right? what I. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because he was asked in court, "Well, did you see the school bus drive bus drive in?" He goes, "No." Now, come on, you're not going to forget seeing a school bus drive right past you, right? With all the kids. Yeah. Which means that instead of seeing the vehicle at 3.45, he saw Teresa he leave at 2.45. That's right. <laughs> Which is exactly when Stephen said, I saw her leave, right? And it all now makes perfect sense. And the state are going, ah, we're off the hook, guys, because he's out by an hour. But in actual fact, he may have had the time incorrect on his watch because he forgot to change it, Right. So it now makes perfect sense, and it chimes in with what, um, as Stephen said, that I saw her leave, right? Yeah. Okay. 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 I, reckon we, I reckon we do one more page. Okay. That same afternoon, 16-year-old Brandon Dassey and older brother Blaine arrived home on their yellow school bus. I. Yeah. Quote, I do not have any personal knowledge of who made the appointment with Auto Trader to have my mother's van photographed, but I did help clean the van so that it could be sold. End quote. Blaine Dassey said. Quote, on October 31st, 2005, when the school bus driver brought Brandon and me home as we traveled west on State Highway 147, I saw Bobby on State Highway 147 in a bluish or greenish vehicle heading towards Michigan. Bobby was not driving his black blazer. Bobby was not home the rest of the evening while I was home. End of quote. Blaine Selfie David also addresses the dark internet searches made from the Dassey personal computer, the one that his mother hired someone to reformat as the murder case was widening in early 2006. Quote, there was only one computer at the residence and it was always in Bobby's room sitting near a desk. The computer had a password. The computer had an AOL dial-up internet connection. Bobby was the primary user of the computer. At no time did I ever do searches for pornographic images or words related to pornography, words related to violence, words related to death, words related to mutilations, words related to torture, words related to guns or knives, words related to Teresa Halbach, words related to Stephen Avery, words related to DNA, or words related to dead, mutilated, or dismembered female bodies, end of quote. Uh, if you read the rest of uh, the small section on page 15, there's a natural break, and we can stop there. Sure. Blaine Dass's sworn statement indicates the only time he used the computer was to, for homework and occasionally to send instant messages to people. Quote, at no time did I ever create a folder for Teresa Halbach, my uncle Stephen, DNA, or news so stories on the murder. End of quote. Awesome. Awesome. So we know, we know that it wasn't Blaine who was doing those computer searches, they can be patent matched to one person only on October the 31st, and that's Bobby Dassey. And that's very, very important. But it's interesting that Blaine saw Bobby in a greenish vehicle and it wasn't the blazer, right? Yeah. So, uh, and uh, the boys were dropped off at 3.45, right? So it all sort of makes sense if some event took place prior to when Blaine saw Bobby in the, in the green car. 
when will we ever find out what actually ha happened? Because we have three million scenarios over here going. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Well, um, guys in chat and on the panel, how did you think that session went? I thought I thought it went remarkably well. What I did think, you think so too. I, I think that if the jury had heard all of this information, that uh, they couldn't possibly have committed Stephen. There's too much reasonable doubt. Correct. Correct. And it's remarkable now that Kathleen Zona has taken that very pure approach uh, by honing in on Bobby Dassey, right? And of course, none of this was heard back in 2007. Uh, the Vili CD that was suppressed, all of these affidavits came long after. And now Kathleen Zona is presenting this. Uh, in her in her new filing, and it's remarkable that um, this was all written uh, in the Wrecking Crew years ago, and now we're reading it uh, out now, and it's incredible the relevance of what we see in the filing in 2022. Incredible. Yeah, and we can draw like parallels. We're not just focusing on one thing. We can bring all these different aspects all at once and i think um yeah it just how did they not how they were not allowed to have a danny that just boggles my mind i know right. how it happened and why but it's still isn't it just, just, just yeah, isn't it interesting how as we went through this and we go back now and relook at this old stuff and how it falls into place, and it has a di almost a different meaning, a deep meaning. Mm -hmm. it, it's like, oh, damn, okay, now that makes sense. You know, it's trying to be, you know, as, as Big Jeff, you know, and being the reasonable man, the reasonable person when you look at the stuff, because you get into some of this really unreasonable shit that goes on. I think about the zippers. That whole scenario is so unreasonable. I think about the flower video that we got. It's so unreasonable. It's ridiculous. And then I think about this call. 17 fucking years to get it. It wasn't turned over to Loy. It wasn't turned over to Beauty and String. And uh, or no one else all the way up until Zellner gets it here a few months ago. It was buried. Correct. It's so unreasonable. Correct. Correct. And you're correct, Jack61. Even though we're reading this chapter and it's years old, we're now starting to put all the connections together and it's all starting to make a lot of sense. Yeah. And it's looking very, very damning. Very damning. I just wonder what else there is, uh, Doc, uh, Doc and everyone, that we that we don't know that, that's been kept away that is would be beneficial to Stephen and Brendan that would help them in their case. That's 100% correct. Uh, Neverly, did you have a comment? Yeah, I agree with what Jack said completely you know that one call whether it was maliciously or accidentally buried we don't know but uh and then i'm looking also jack behind your head that cuss road and the tape and all the cars and all the i'm oh like my, my goodness what happened there what happened there the clandestine uh, burial site you know Correct. the floodlights at night uh the tape blocking off the road that nobody could come and go, you know what I mean? Blunt, right. bl blunt and bloody instrument in the back of the raft that's mentioned one time and yes. disappears. What the what the hell, man? Yeah. It's it's infuri it's, inf it's infuriating to me as a, an American citizen. I don't live in Wisconsin, but I don't care. It should never happen. It it, it just should never happen. I don't, you know. It, Correct. I, I got to stop. I'm going to get mad again and break my new iPad. I got to stop. Yeah, breaking you, you don't want to do that. But uh, the remarkable thing is that a story can be told, right? When you see the, the pattern of the blood on uh, the, the back door, uh, showing that the blood hit at 90 degrees and dripped down. The blood never went in the direction where Teresa Horbach was flung uh, in the back of her uh, vehicle. The fact that there's blood on the plastic uh, 
wheel well inside the trunk, the, uh, the, the trunk of the vehicle indicates that her head was rolling around, which means that the vehicle was in motion. She was being yeah. driven. She was being driven somewhere. But the carpet, the, was, that, that, the carpet was clean. The, the carpet was clean, which indicates that it was removed. Pristine. It pristine and clean and removed, right? It all now makes perfect sense. And as Jack 61 alluded to, a bloody blunt object in the back of the, of the SUV is indicative that she was struck, right? The blood on the back door is indicative that she was likely surprised by her attacker and hit from behind and repeatedly, right? It now brings a Roofing different camera. scenario. Yes. <laughs> Roofing hammer. Oh, no. <laughs> it now brings a different scenario that is very, very different to the state. And Ken Kratz is backpedaling. He knows. He knows it looks bad. He knows that Kathleen Zona, with her experts, have got all the evidence there that would completely destroy the state's case. So uh, it's remarkable, guys, that we're now reading these chapters. And we'll do a lot of the chapters from this book, which will start bringing together the jigsaw puzzle pieces that will blow your mind. <laughs> that were there. The answers were there, but we never could put them all together. We now have that ability to put it all together. So, guys, I really hope that uh, everyone in chat, thank you so much for your support. It's good to be back, and hopefully you enjoyed the format. And thank you, Neverly, for that excellent read. Um, and we'll oh, be thank back. Thank you for your also. help. No, nah, not at all. We'll be back uh, next week to do it all over again. So, guys, if we can just have a quick, quick closing statement uh how you're doing how things are coming along and uh, then we'll close the podcast and neverly would you like to go first um yeah I i've been gone for a couple of months i think or something close to it i had to take care of certain things but you know what guys um i really miss being in this community being with my uh fellow buddies from foul play and thinking about the case, reading about the, all of that. And yes, Dr. Silkman and I did it kind of in the, you know, behind the scene because I only had this much time and he wasn't feeling well. So, um, and then Zellner filed uh, the petition and I, that was kind of an in injection of life for me. I got really excited and um, I'm so happy that I got to read it and think about it. And as Jack said, everything now has a different meaning. And yeah, even though we don't know what actually happened and William in chat just said, whatever happened to her, you know, it was awful. Um, rest in peace, Teresa and rest in peace indeed. But uh, it's amazing. But the truth is slowly coming out. All the phone calls are coming out. There was that other phone call that Foul Play posted about a woman who called, uh, I don't know which one, uh, Manitowoc or Calumet, and said, I saw two guys in some gravel area with a truck, and she called and reported. We never heard that phone call before. From Manitowoc. Yeah. Manitowoc. Manitowoc, yeah. Manitowoc, yeah. Look at Sawinski. I mean, the um, lengths and steps that Kathleen took, Kathleen Zellner took to vet Sawinski, he got his ex girlfriend. I mean, an ex girlfriend is an ex girlfriend or ex boyfriend for a reason. And for her to come and to corroborate that I said it, corroborate, that, you know, tells you something mm -hmm. that it was the truth. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much, Neverly. Um, Alice. Yeah, doing good, Doc. Um, I've just finished my um, A Long Walk to Justice book um, about Luke's case, uh, which was written by Scott Forbes, who joined Luke's appeal teams and was also in the documentary as well. Um, so he's wrote a book and he's put a bit more information in. So I've finished that and I'm I'm going to maybe see if I can get him to come on my channel and talk about Fantastic. it. Um, we've also had Mary B, 
who's joined us in chat. Um, she says that she's a newcomer and she's been looking for Welcome. Uh, good people uh, who Welcome. Uh, talk about the case. Um, and she's came across us tonight. So welcome, Mary B. Uh, she's like, do you guys have a reading of the last case file? Like all of it, I started another one, but it is three and a half hours long. I'm only halfway done. Yes, we do. We read it. You'll find it on the channel. We read it. We discussed it. Um, and uh, we read it completely without really discussing much. But then there's other videos there that we've actually discussed the whole thing by section by section. So you'll find that on the, the, the channel as well. Uh, please do go and have a look. And they're probably just as long, if not longer, because we say we go for an hour or two and we end up going for four. So it could be the same length or a bit longer. So please Correct. enjoy. Um, like, share, subscribe, all the youtube -y things. And thank you to everyone in chat and panel. Fantastic. Thank you. And just echoing that, uh, for especially for the newcomers, welcome very much. If you go to our Discord channel, uh, our YouTube channel, and also our library, uh, you will see that we have uh, accumulated a huge amount of resources, all free, all for you to do your own research. And, uh, you know, God bless you. <laughs> You're really going to be lost because there's a huge amount of stuff there. A lot of good work has been done. Please enjoy. Uh, I don't recall. What about yourself? I'm doing well. I, ever since the, we uh, finished going over the motion was it Thursday night, Travis had um, really focused on the State v. Wilson case, so I've been going over that, and I'm anxious to see you know, it, how, how if we apply the test that they used, how what we all think, how it applies to, you know, her current, what she what she points out in her current motion. Yes. To the facts of Stephen's case. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not strong on the legal aspects, um, but Travis is. He's a he's an uh, an attorney. Is an attorney, mm -hmm. Travis? I take, and also I don't recall you're you're in the legal profession as well, right? I am. Um, I am yep. an attorney, but I'm new. I'm new. I've only been doing it a little over two years. Where Travis is like thirty something years. So yeah, yeah. correct, correct. And uh, again, again, we're so fortunate to have you on the panel as well. Uh, and that that's why I think we're so lucky in foul play that. We have representatives from all over the place. Uh, my own background is in DNA, molecular biology, and we have also um, people in the law profession, and that's pretty powerful to be on a panel, and that's incredible. Thank you, I don't recall. Uh, any other any other comments I don't recall? No, no, that's, that's all. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Uh, Susan, what about yourself? Oh, I'm doing really good. I, I I have a lot of hope with this new PCR. Um, I know Wisconsin, and I know how you know shady they are, but it's going to be hard for them to get around an evidentiary hearing on this. And I I truly believe um, they don't, they can't fall back on um, procedurally barred. Um, I'm just very hopeful. That that's going to happen now once it gets to an evidentiary hearing you know that's another hurdle to get past because they'll do Perfect. everything in their power i believe to oh yeah you know to quash it but um still it's good to have yeah. hope <laughs> yeah. 100%, 100%. and i have that yeah and i just wanted to tell mari b that um the last two open mics that we did uh, where, where we go over Kathleen's new uh, motion, the we did it this past Thursday on the 25th, and then the Sunday prior to that um, is the first uh, part of it. So those are two really good ones to listen to because we read it as well as discuss it as we go. So I would recommend you looking at those. Thank you, Excellent. and welcome to Foul Play. Come into yeah. Discord. You'll love it. 
Yep, and uh, just to answer Mari B's question, there are really two unknown DNA samples that we know about, um, CX, which is blood that was found at the quarry. It doesn't belong to a Dassey, it doesn't belong to an Avery, and it's a male profile, a full male profile. We have no idea who left their blood in the quarry, and the quarry just happened to be the area uh, where uh, some of the cremains were found, right? No one knows who CX belongs to. And the big one, the big one, the blood on the victim's vehicle, A23. We don't know whose DNA that belongs to. And as Jack61 said, we don't know who the DNA on the flashcard belongs to either, right? So there are unknown DNA samples. Plus, on the number plate, there's DNA on the number plate. We've got no idea who that belongs to as well. So, and there's also uh, fingerprints. Uh, fingerprints, eight sets of prints. No one knows who they belong to, which means that Zelna needs to get access to the RAV. Here's my prediction. The RAV is either gone or there's going to be a sudden fire <laughs> and it will disappear. <laughs> it will disappear in thin air, just like the bones. I hope it doesn't, but I have a feeling that the RAV 4 is long gone. They definitely don't want to test. They don't want Zelda to test, test either that or the blinker light, right? The, the RAV4, to answer what happened, the, the answers are all on the RAV4. Forget elsewhere. The RAV4 is the number, number one piece of forensic evidence that Zelda needs to get access to. All right, uh, Jack61. Yeah, I'd agree with that, Doc. Uh, yeah, she needs access to the RAV4, um, other things too, but definitely the RAV4 first. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the, I'll see some new names in the chat. I've been, um, I've only got one monitor, but I'm you know, trying to look around and welcome all the new people into the foul play and, and thanks for coming and listening in. Uh, you know, for anyone that's new to the case, uh, don't listen to anyone. As you probably surmised from Doc and, and others talking, this is these two cases are, are extremely complicated, and uh, and we still there's still things that we don't have for some reason. After all these years, we can't seem to get our hands on. We're trying, we we keep trying. With that said, uh, I did just submit a, a 25 item open records request to Calumet County. I'm sure that I'm off the Christmas card list now, and. Um, they may send a leg breaker after me. I don't know. But these are things, most of these things, some of the things are, are already out there, but I, I don't think we should have our own copy. Um, but yes. a lot of a lot of these things that I requested are not out there at all. No one has them as far as I know. Uh, they, if they do, they're keeping them to themselves. So got that submitted. We'll see where that goes. Open mark tomorrow is going to be um, a couple of depositions, hopefully Susan and and. Um, and just Rhonda and whoever else that uh, wants to read and join. Uh, it's going to be Amy Lehman, part two. I think it's 30 pages. It's her second part. It's not very long. And then, uh, uh, oh, gosh, I think his name is Steve Tinker. He's the boss of the DCI. This is moving back into 2005 to the depositions. Yeah, so I'm sorry. I'm trying to name off all these things and, and hurry. This is the 2005 depositions. We're going to be going back in time a little bit and covering those. Um, and, the, you know, there's and Dasa and basically doing the same thing we're doing here. We're going to dissect it a little bit as we read along. Correct. I, I, Doc, I, I do want to clear up one thing. Uh, I, I don't know yes. where this I don't know where this came from. I got into a pretty good racket today with some someone on Reddit. And this concerns the. No, Sol- no. <laughs> this concerns the Sowinsky call and and the point that it gets transferred. You know, we hear the it's a short call. It's only a minute. It gets transferred. She dialed the number. She clearly is dialing a cell phone, most likely, I say clearly, most likely a cell phone, and connects the call. And boom, it's done. Well, then the, someone, I'm not going to get any names, it don't matter, said that this was got transferred to Calumet. That's Sergeant Seglub was a Calumet officer. No, he's not. He's a manic walk officer. There is no more of that call. That's it. End of story. So. I want to clear that Correct. up. Anybody out there that has read this on Reddit or wherever else, it's not true. This is all Manitowoc. Um, Correct. And yeah, uh, yeah. Go ahead. I was I was going to say, um, 
Now, Sawinski calls in on November the 6th. Thank yep. Lord, Bushman, Siders, and a few others just, uh, just happened to be at Cuss <laughs> just happened to be at Cuss Road one day after. That's right. They're part of search team. They're part of search team A. So uh, something has gone on because they're right at the hot spot. Okay, right at the hot spot, and that's when they discover the uh, the um, the bones at Cuss oh, Road. Land and stone in the report. The clan and stone bones. That's right. And the burnt electronics in Stephen Avery's burn barrel. One day after, on November the 8th, boom, all the cremains are found. So it's very, very interesting how things happen after Tom Swinski called in on November the 6th. Correct. I, I, interesting. I agree. I agree. Anyway, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, this has been great today. I, I really enjoyed going through this book and now second, I'm looking forward to more of it. I think it's a really great way to Got to understand uh, the, the writing at the time and the thinking at the time, but it also is a reminder of what we know now versus what we knew then. So, anyway, Correct. hope everybody, everybody can join us tomorrow and we'll get through some depositions, some really interesting stuff there. So, thanks, Doc. Correct. What time, Correct. Back? Same what time, time as, tomorrow? Same time as today, 5 p.m. Central. Oh, okay. Correct. Awesome. Well, look. Thank you very much, guys. I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion today. It's good to see Neverly back. I'm happy to be back as as well. And thank you so much for everyone in chat for your uh, continual support and encouragement. Uh, if you've enjoyed the podcast, uh, please leave your DNA on the thumbs up button. And guys, we'll all catch you next week for this uh, continuation of this series, Reading with the Crew. Thank you so much. This has been a Foul Play production.